So I'm now sharing my screen. You should be able to see, hang on. I have to set it so that you don't see yourselves. Okay, so you can see the map of Italy and the area that, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get my things screen set here. Here we go. So, all right, you're looking at Italy and um, the area that's highlighted is Northern Tuscany. We're, I'm in the Florentine Hills of Tuscany. This is not working. Okay, I'm not gonna worry about that. Y'all gonna have to just look at my, my computer screen. So we're right here, we're just to the Southwest of Florence. Here's a, um, a blown up map. So you can see where we are. These are the places that we're gonna be talking about. This area down here at the bottom with all the little pink highlights, that's where I live. There is, um, I'm at the castle of Popiana, which is right here where my cursor is. We're gonna talk about this area, the three castles of Monte Spertoli, Monte Gufoni, and Popiano, and then these two villas, Fossipucci and Guicciardini. We're also gonna mention Poggio Acaiano and Carmignano, which are up here to the north. And then we're gonna talk about two artists who came also from the neighborhood from the town of Vinci and the town of Pontorme, which is near Empoli. So that's kind of where, we are, where we're located this time, okay? So we're making our visit to the Florentine Hills of Chianti. This area is characterized by um, really small farms that produce olive oil, wine, wheat, um, cheese as well, some prosciutto and that kind of stuff the sort of typical products of Tuscany. We've had so much rain that it looks like Ireland around here. But you can see how it's very ro light, gently rolling countryside with these little um, stone farmhouses here and there. Here's an ancient vineyard. I love this vineyard. You can see the vines were planted between rows of olives. That's the way they used to do it out here. It wasn't just monoculture, everything was really mixed. And these uh, vines are in particular beautiful. They're called vitae maritate. They're married vines. So the vines are literally, um, they're growing up the trunk of a tree. There's a tree planted there for each vine. It's kept pruned very short so that it doesn't shade the vine, but each vine is married to a tree. I think that's very sweet. This is not an uncommon scene around here. These guys are just having a break from their um, harvesting, having lunch in the field. Here's a little fixer up or just in case anybody wants to move to Italy. It's got a great view out the back. If you would rather just visit, I'm having some issues here with my small screen, so sorry for the overlap. But if you would prefer not to buy a house, but just stay over, maybe rent one, this is an option for you. Um, these are all things here in the neighborhood. So here's where I live at the Castle of Popiano. Right up here on the hill, I don't live in the castle. I rent from the Count and Countess and I live down here. My little house is right nestled in those trees right there. Here's the map again. So we're zooming in on that area to the southwest of Florence. Here's the castle of Popiano. So I'm right here. I'm gonna go back to the map. There's the castle of Popiano. And then down the ridge here is um, called the Villa Guicciardini where this the same family that owns the castle also lives um, in this compound where this villa is. And that's gonna be important later. So I'm just trying to give you a visual of that so you know what we're talking about. Um, and then here is a panoramic view for you. So you can see from the town of Monte Spiritually, you can see the Castle of Monte Spiritually, Castle of Monte Gufani, Villa Bossipucci, the Castle of Popiano, and Villa Guicciardini. These castles were all built um, in around the turn of the first millennium, and they were built by minor nobility who came from Florence. Um, the Florentine city state gave large swaths of land to this class of minor nobility, um, and in return, asked for um, them to help raise an army for the defense of Florence when necessary. And in particular, in this area, um, these castles, Monte Gufoni, Popiano, Monte Spiritually, they form a triangle here. There's a trade route that comes in from Florence, swings through this river valley, and goes down towards Volterra. So their job in the Middle Ages was to protect this trade route. So these castles were given to um, a series of uh, minor nobility from the, the city of Florence. And they then were able, they had absolute rule over their property. They could do whatever they wanted. Most of them tenant farmed it and then took all the products um, back into the city. So here's the castle of Monte Spertoli. This was the Machiavelli family for generations. Um, Niccolo Machiavelli's third great-grandfather owned this castle. It's nestled up in here. You can't get a good view of it. It's kind of hidden. 
It's in the city of, the, I say city, town or village of Monte Spiritually. This is the, um, the um, town hall of Monte Spiritually, which is where, this is my municipal office. So if I, ever, if I ever have to do any kind of administrative business, this is where I go. Here's Monte Gufani. Back here on the horizon, you can see it's sticking up on top of this hill. Monte Gufani was given to the Acciaioli family, one of the very uh, powerful Florentine families. Um, it was renovated several times. It changed hands several times as well. One big renovation in the 1300s um, was when they added this tower, which is an exact replica of the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. The tower of Palazzo Vecchio is on the right. And then the little um, country version out here at Monte Gufani is right here. That's so funny that they did that. This is the entryway to Monte Gufani on the left and then their drawing room basically on the right. So again, we're gonna talk about these castles in a minute, it'll make sense why we're doing all this. Um, here's Popiana, this is where I live. So the Count and Countess again live in the castle, within the castle walls right here. This is the Bordigo. Um, basically, these are all of the tenant farmer houses that um, were connected with the castle. So now they're rented to people like me. This is my house right here. This little L, you can see my cursor on top of it. My garden that we were just out in is this little dark area that's in shade right here. So I'm just gonna take you through Popiano so you can get an idea of what it's like up here. We're, we're between, we're sort of 15 minutes between a couple of um, bigger towns, but it's extremely rural. And this is basically what the backyard looks like. So this is the inside of the castle. You're up in the courtyard. Um, the picture on the left was taken from the tall tower and Susan Warren is making an appearance. You're a cameo, Susan Warren, here you are. It's one of um, some of my visitors, we went to the castle. And now here's another view from the top of the castle. Again, the top of the tower, excuse me, again, back out over the Borgo where my house is and then down to this area where that villa is located. So just keep that in mind because we'll be talking about that in just a few minutes. Here's some more uh, views of Copiano. This is right in front of the castle. Coming down the um, hill towards my house, you pass what was the, the building there was the blacksmith shop. So that little ring is where you could ride up and tie up your horse while your horse was getting shooed. There is this lovely um, ancient, or Gothic anyway, terracotta Madonna in that great little trefoil niche. And it's just been there kind of melting under the elements, unfortunately, since the Middle Ages. And the little, this little um, door is a Bucchetto Divino or a wine door. And they actually, it's, it's right over here next to this door. This is a very typical feature of the um, palaces of the nobility in the center of Florence. So these guys who, the landed nobility had um, their estates in the countryside, the products that were made here, things like wine, olive oil, cheese, prosciutto, whatnot, were brought into the city. They were actually sold from the ground floors of their palaces, and they literally would serve wine in a glass through this little wine door. And they're all over the place. They're really cute. This, you can still see the hinge on this one. It had a little door on it even. And the cool thing is that these things are actually back in use now because you can actually serve customers. You can maintain social distance and serve customers through your Bucchetto Divino. So some stores are, there are even gelato shops that are serving gelato through the Bucchetto Divino. It's very cute. I'm glad they're back in use. So then if you round the bend right here after the Madonna, this is my house, which y'all some of y'all saw from outside just a minute ago. And then here we are back at the castle. Um, Let's jump back in time a little bit. Think about uh, World War II. Y'all know Italy saw a lot of action during the war. Um, when it became apparent that um, the cultural patrimony of the country was in trouble, not only from bombing, but Hitler was amassing an art collection in Linz in Austria. Um, so the officials who were in charge of museums, the fine arts ministry, the superintendente in Florence, decided to get works of art out of the city and send them out into the countryside. So from Florence, um, the collections from the Galleria degli Uffizi and Palazzo Pitti, two of major museums, between three and 400 works were sent out here to this area west of the city. And they were first sent to Poggio Acaiano, right up here at the top. Um, there's a Medici villa up there. It's really beautiful. It's frescoed by Contormo, the artist who we're going to talk about um, in just a moment. 
It's a nice visit if y'all ever come back to Tuscany, we can go up there and take a look. So these uh, paintings from the Uffizi and Palazzo Pitti were brought to Poggio a Caiano. Uh, this was in November of 1942. Um, they didn't stay there very long and I have no idea why they would have gone to the trouble to then move them, but they very shortly thereafter moved all these paintings, 300 plus paintings from Poggio a Caiano. They grabbed an altarpiece out of the church of San Michele in Carbignano and they took them down to the four Air, the four properties down here. These are four deposits right here. So that big panorama that you just saw, I'm going to go back to it for you. Um, four of these properties, the four properties on the right, all had deposits of the major masterpieces from Florence. So this was how to protect these pieces from being bombed and damaged and how to keep them out of the hands of Hitler, who was trying to take them away for his private art collection. Um, the plan worked Basically, it worked really well, but this area was pummeled in um, 1944. So imagine the scene as the Germans are retreating and the Allies are coming up the peninsula of Italy. The partisans are active, everybody's bombing everybody else. This is just an idea of some troop movements in this area. The slide on the left shows troop movements um, coming up from the south towards Monte Spertoli. Um, this is the Popiano area. On the right, you see divisions um, from New Zealand who moved straight through basically that trade route that these castles are supposed to be protecting and just hammered Popiano right here and went on to Monte Gufani. So the fate of the pictures is this. Um, here's actually, here's liberation, first of all. So finally, in late July 1944, Monte Spiritually was liberated. Um, the picture on the left shows that little fixer upper that we just looked at and here's a photograph of these tanks moving in past the fixer upper coming up towards Monte Spiritually and towards Popiano. And then the picture on the right is the center of Monte Spiritually, so where that town hall is. This is the town, this is actually the street where I do my shopping and the mill that we're about to see is on the street as well. Um, so obviously all these guys had bigger fish to fry than art deposits. And I'm not sure if these people even knew the art was deposited there because they were hidden. It was supposed to be a secret. So these guys may not have known. The monuments men who were working um, from the American side of things, trying to protect um, masterpieces in Europe, they may have known that these were here. But um, what ended up happening is that basically, in, in the end, all the works of art made it back to Florence. It took them a year, July 1945, all the works of art came back there. The Villa Bossi property, which is located about right here, was unfortunately raided. And actually, it's more like up here. It was raided. The paintings were loaded up and carted north. They were recovered in Alto Adige, which is the um, region of Italy that borders Austria. Um, the Monte Gufani painting survived miraculously because one of the custodians convinced the Germans not to burn them. That's what was about to happen. The Nazis were coming through on their retreat up the peninsula and basically just took over the property. They needed beds for troops. They were looking for food. They, 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 they found the art. By the, by the time they found this, though, it was late July. Had this happened a month earlier, these might have been carted up to Alto IDJ as well. Um, that did not happen in this case. One of the custodians of Monte Gufani managed to um, convince them not to um, either steal or burn these works. What you're seeing here, there were hundreds of works here at Monte Gufani. You're seeing two works by Botticelli, the Palade and the Centaur on the right, and then on the left is one of the most famous paintings in the world of uh, Botticelli's uh, Primavera or Springtime. Popiano fared a little bit less well. This is the villa of Popiano, which obviously has taken um, a shell. Those troops from New Zealand who trampled over through Popiano, this is kind of unfortunate side effect of that. The paintings, all, all of the works of art survived. There was one painting though that was heavily damaged and it's this work, which is called The Visitation. It was by Jacopo Plantormo. And interestingly enough, I had actually decided to speak about this painting. I love this painting. I decided to talk about this painting before I knew that it was stored here. So I was kind of, that's why I threw in all this extra um, talk about World War II in the art deposits, because this painting was actually stored right here where I live. So this is a painting of the visitation. We're gonna see it better. I'm just gonna at least get the subject matter out there, then we'll move on. This is the Virgin Mary here, who is pregnant, miraculously pregnant with Jesus, and she meets her cousin, who is Saint Elizabeth, and she's also pregnant with John the Baptist. So that's the meeting of these two women coming together, both of whom 
part miraculously with child and they kind of know what's happening. So we'll see that. It's painted by Jacopo Pontormo, Jacopo Carucci, excuse me, from Pontorme. Here's a picture of Pontorme. Pontorme is a little town that's been incorporated now into the city of um, Empoli. And this is Pontormo's house on the left. I take music lessons here. So I drove by the other day and just snapped a shot of Pontormo's front door. I'm glad he's hanging his Italian flag out for solidarity. And then across the street is Pontormo's across the street neighbor. He has his flag out for solidarity too. So Pontormo was born here in 1494. He was orphaned as a young boy. He had a talent for art. So he was apprenticed to artist workshops in Florence. Um, I don't know the details of this. I don't know if anybody really knows the details of this, but he seems to have gotten some help from kind of a local connection because he ended up in the workshop of Leonardo da Vinci. So that was kind of a um, key internship to get a hold of. So young uh, Jacopo Carucci called Pontormo was in the workshop of Leonardo da Vinci. Um, this is the portrait of Ginevra da Vinci from the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. Lovely, classic uh, Leonardo portrait. He, uh, Pontormo, after he left the studio of Leonardo, went to the studio of Piero del Cosimo, who was kind of a quirky high Renaissance painter in Venice. This is another visitation scene. This is a, a very common um, Bible scene that is depicted. So here's again, Virgin Mary is um, greeting her cousin. And this is the typical way that these scenes are represented. They're shaking hands. They're just like walking down the sidewalk, shake hands. So after Piero di Cosimo, the studio of Piero, uh, Pontorma moved into the studio of Andrea del Sarto, who is, um, to me, one of the greatest high Renaissance artists. He was kind of right there at the edge of the end of high Renaissance, um, which is as uh, Pontorma was too. So we'll see what happens to the Renaissance in the next couple of decades. But this is Andrea del Sarto, who's just taken um, that use of chiaroscuro light and shade to show uh, modeling, but also atmosphere. I mean, it looks like Mississippi in this picture, don't y'all think? The humidity, you can just feel that the humidity in the atmosphere of this Andrea um, del Sarto, Madonna and Child. So Pontormo has spent time now in the studios of these three artists. At age 18, he decides he's going to leave the studio of Andrea del Sarto and go out on his own. So the first thing he does is he goes to Rome to see what's going on in Rome. And this is what's going on in Rome. He goes to the Vatican. Raphael's painting the Stanze, the papal apartments. This is the uh, on the right, Raphael's fresco of the School of Athens. Major, major high Renaissance work of art. This is the canonical um, high Renaissance composition. Michelangelo, as you, as you see on the left, was painting in the Sistine Chapel. He was kind of pushing the edge of the envelope a little bit. So Raphael has depicted this very deep, perfectly mathematical one point perspective. His figures were all in perfect proportion right here about the middle of the composition. The composition is circular in space, which kind of draws us in. There's lots of detail of everyday life. And then Raphael was so impressed by what he saw in the Sistine ceiling over here on the left. After he completed the painting, the Fresco School of Athens, he came over and painted on top this figure of the thinker down here at the bottom. So look at the monumentality of um, Michelangelo's image and the later figure added by Raphael. So Michelangelo is having huge influence on all of these artists, including Pontormo. So Pontormo sees these works. He goes back to uh, Florence. He's 20 years old and he gets a commission to do a visitation. This is a fresco, again, the visitation. And he's just gotten out of um, working for the studios of Leonardo, for Andrea del Sarto. He's seen what's going on in Rome. And this is what he decides to paint for his uh, visitation. It's in Sant Santissima Annunziata. Um, I may have repeated myself. Um, so you can see, again, the handshake is the key moment here of the visitation. The center of this composition is a nice, solid triangle surrounded by a circle, a sphere in space that once again has some space for us right here. We're being invited into this scene. And then there's a nice solid square here as well. So Pontormo has learned his lesson from these, all of these masters that he has worked with and that he has studied. His study trip to Rome really paid off because he came back and painted a perfect high Renaissance fresco. So here's Pontormo at age 20, and this is what he's done with what he's learned. 10 years later, Pontormo gets 
a commission to paint yet another visitation. This one is on panel, it's enormous, it's greater than life size. It is to decorate the family chapel of the Pindadori family. This is the guy who sells paints and pigments and brushes to all of the artists. They chose Pontormo to decorate their family chapel in the little church of San Michele in Carmignano. So here's the painting that you saw damaged in the Villa Popiano, the Villa Guicciardini. So now this is Pontormo 10 years later. So just take another look here. Pontormo has studied, he's been to Rome, he's absorbed Raphael, everything else, and this is what he, young Pontormo paints this. 10 years later, Pontormo has digested everything that he learned from those artists. He's come into his own, and this is what he paints as his visitation. And it's, 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 this panel is enormous. It's really, really impressive. I hope y'all's computer screens can do it some justice. Um, you can see that he has completely left behind the high renaissance, kind of the, the rigid rule book of high renaissance compositions. So first of all, the background is basically, is, he's done a good job of the perspective, but he's, what he's done is painted a neutral background because that's not the point. Proportion is gone. The proportion of the figures to the background is gone. There are two little um, observers over here in the back. The proportion obviously is totally off because the point of mannerism is not perfect proportion and perfect realism. The point of mannerism is to convey emotion. So what's going on here is this emotional meeting of these two women, of Mary and St. Anne. So the handshake is gone. They're, they're starting to embrace each other, but they've stopped and they're exchanging this extremely poignant gaze. So they have an idea of, I mean, they're both at this point, both of them are pregnant with Jesus and St. John the Baptist, and they have an idea of what's to come. So here are these women. The idea then is to portray emotion. And if it's necessary to stretch the visual truth a little bit, then off you go. So what Pontormo's done is elongated these figures. The proportion is totally, completely non-realistic. Somebody's in my house. Um, and he's also accentuated their midsections. So obviously these two women are pregnant. So he's kind of, he kind of wants to make sure that you don't forget that. He's also put a very interesting, um, he's made an interesting choice for what to be the center of the comp composition. As you saw in the high Renaissance version, the handshake is in the middle. That's the point, the handshake. So in the very center of the composition is a handshake. If you just draw two diagonal lines through this composition, this is the center of the composition. And basically it's the baby Jesus. So we're looking at this strong, emotional glance between these two women and they absolutely know what's going on. The two women in the back are there have been called handmaidens. Women in the 1500s in Florence traveled in pairs. They didn't go out alone. So each woman would have her handmaiden with her. They've been interpreted though as the alter ego of Mary and Elizabeth. And it's them that connect with us. So we are not being invited into this scene. Mary and Elizabeth do not notice us. They don't notice the handmaidens. Those kind of poignant and yet strong glances of the handmaidens that are coming out to us, they're inviting us into this scene, but in a more of a liberal meditative kind of a way. So I'm gonna talk quickly about the light in here. Uh, Pontormo also did some really interesting things with light. Um, I'm going to show you the inside of the church first because he used the natural light in the church. This is the exterior of the church in Carmignano. This is the painting coming down off the wall. It was uh, taken down for restoration probably five years ago and then um, was shown in an exhibit in Florence and it was also in the United States. I think it was in Los Angeles. I think it was in New York as well. Some of y'all may have seen it. Um, so this is the painting coming down for cleaning. This is a, again the interior of the church and our painting is over here on the right. So look at the amount of light that is coming in from the haps, the three windows down here at the end. Pontormo took advantage of this and used that light as if to light the figures in his visitation. So he's very interestingly turned the main figure into shadow. So Mary, the two figures in the back, their faces are half in shadow, half in light. Elizabeth's face is lit. 
the Virgin Mary, what's lit on the Virgin Mary is her rear end and the back of her neck. So this is an awfully bold move if you think about the high Renaissance compos compositions that um, Antorma was coming out of. So he decided to bear the Mary's neck and highlight it. To me, that shows her vulnerability. Her neck is completely wide open and spotlighted. And then the fact that her face is completely in shadow shows her humility. So Mary has humbly taken on this duty. She knows what's coming. She knows the suffering that's on the way, but she's peaceful at the same time. And you can see that as she greets her cousin, Elizabeth. Quickly, just to show you what the result of the um, restoration was. The painting had been covered in a layer of varnish that obviously turned colors, so it kind of cast a yellow and green sheen over everything. Um, and then the lovely result of the cleaning, which just opens up all of Pontormo's colors. And again, the colors are used with great effect as well. Beautiful painting. So we're, like I said, I'm sorry we're jumping around a little bit, but there's so much that's kind of linked to this area. Um, we're gonna jump to the next topic here. We're remaining in the neighborhood. And here we are with our wheat producers. Um, we all had this, the idea of the visitation really kind of fits right now with us. We've been in lockdown since, um, we've been in super strict lockdown since the 9th of March. So the idea that we're, as of last Monday, we're allowed to actually see people. Um, I actually saw two friends come together and just start crying. They hadn't seen each other in so long. So here, I had a visitation with Johnny the Miller the other day. This is Johnny over here on the right. Um, we have a little, somebody's firing up the motorino. Um, Johnny is the Miller, we'll, who we'll see the inside of his mill in a moment. He, together with Marco the Baker, formed a heritage grain uh, association in Monte Spiritually. It's a short production chain. They work with farmers. Guido here in the middle of this picture is one of the farmers they work with. He's also an archaeologist, very interesting person. That's another fun visit if you come to this area. Um, and then in the middle is Giovanni Fabri who makes pasta. So the miller and the baker got together with a bunch of farmers and decided to create a heritage grain association, heritage wheat association. And the idea was to provide a good living for everybody in the entire step of in the entire process. So the retailer at the end doesn't make all the money. They're very careful to make sure that um, everybody earns their share. And they wanted to provide healthy food for their community. And they supply the school cafeteria, for example. They also sell the grocery store and they furnish this whole area and all the way into Florence. So y'all saw the map, how, what a big swat that is. Um, that's, they actually do, um, cover quite a bit of ground. Um, the guy in the middle is Giovanni Fabri. He's a pasta, pasta maker and he works with their flour as well. He's the uh, person who kind of brought me into this world and actually introduced me to all of these people. I met Giovanni for the first time 15 years ago when I went to the pasta factory. I wanted to see how pasta was made and he did not let me in the door. He put me in his car and drove me to a wheat field because this is where everything starts. So we're going to talk about wheat and I'm going to We have some problem with Elaine, audio. Elaine. Wait, I can, I call Elaine that we have some problem. So we have some problem with Elaine. I can I try to phone her and ask if she can. Possiamo aspettare. Yeah, I I call Elaine and I ask if she if she can reconnect. Wait a minute, thank you. 
Aspettiamo. Aspettiamo. Non è problema. Lorenzo, are you kind of organized? Oh, sorry. While that's getting solved, I was wondering if anyone can, um, that's my first one. I didn't know like if these happen every week, if it's a new thing since quarantine, if most people are from Italy or from the US. Can anyone give a little background while we're waiting? Okay, we have back Elaine. Hey, I'm back. I'm so happy to be back. <laughs> but thank you for asking that wonderful question. Hey, Paul. All right, y'all, I'm sorry about, there's a little uh, lapse there. I live in the middle of nowhere, as y'all just saw, so lost some internet. All right, let me go back to my screen share. Wait, sorry what? Try the technical difficulties. Here. Okay, so here we are back to looking at the Wii. Except I can't make it. There we go. Here we go. Okay, sorry about that, guys. A little hiatus. Um, we were talking about the Wii. The point of, the, of looking at this slide is that the outer brand layer here is kind of cellulose, basically, and doesn't grind. We also, it doesn't grind up into little pieces. In fact, this is what it looks like right here. It's kind of these big, fat flakes. It doesn't grind up. And also, we don't really digest it either. Um, so usually that's removed. But unfortunately, usually a lot of these other layers are removed as well. And these layers are called the noble fiber. And you really want to keep that in there. Um, so moving right along, um, think about wheat in two categories. I'm going to just go through kind of the main um, variables here with wheat, and then I'm going to start making pasta and y'all can start asking me questions. There are two main botanical groups of wheat, hard wheat and soft wheat. Um, hard wheat is called semolina in the United States. Here in Italy, it's used for pasta. In the South, it's always used for pasta and also bread. Um, soft wheat is what in the United States is called all-purpose flour, it's that fluffy white stuff. Um, sometimes whiter than other times, sometimes browner than others, um, depending upon all these different factors down here. Um, heritage wheat varieties that we were talking about, those are the kinds of grain that people have been eating for the last 10,000 years. So as soon as people stopped um, being nomadic hunter-gatherers and formed settled societies, we started cultivating grain and we started eating grain in various forms and even grinding it up and making bread and whatnot eventually. So human beings have been eating wheat for 10,000 years. Right after World War II, they decided to modify this wheat and they did this on purpose. They did it so as to have higher production, have a higher yield, and they did it so as to um, facilitate uh, making processed food. So they're, they're facilitating industrial pr processing methods for food. So the main, the various things happened to the wheat when this was done. One of the important things is that they modified the gluten. Gluten is a vegetal protein that exists in the endosperm. There's gluten in here. Gluten from a heritage wheat variety has a single chemical bond, just one. It's still kind of, your body has to work to digest it. When they modified the wheat, they decided to strengthen the gluten. So gluten in these hybrid modern varieties has a triple chemical bond. So not only is it difficult to digest, some people cannot digest it. And that is the reason for the gluten intolerance that we've seen so much of lately. Gluten intolerance is rampant 
And it's been traced back to these modifications that were made to the wheat that humans have been eating for 10,000 years. So if we take half a step backwards to 1950, we still have the seeds. So tons of people are starting to be more interested in um, working with, eating, growing these heritage grains. And there, there's a university, the University of Florence actually has experimental field, fields nearby. And um, they are doing a lot of research into these grains. They're extremely good for you. They're very good for your lipid profile, good for cardiovascular health. They actually help prevent um, pancreatic cancer given the high number, high amounts of antioxidants, minerals, vitamins. Even the, just the germ itself contains um, tons of vitamin E, vitamin A, vitamin B6. The, the grain, there's the piece of grain is like a little superfood. It contains everything that you need. Um, milling methods really have an effect on that. So here's the mill. Just take you inside the mill in Monte Sperto. When you stone grind wheat, you literally just crush the whole thing and you get whole grain. When you use industrial roller method, the industrial rollers, um, the wheat is uh, dampened first. They actually add water to the wheat so that they can separate out every single thing that is not the endosperm. So in order, in order to use these industrial roller mills, and the goal of which is to make some nice fluffy white flour, um, they remove all of the bran, all of the noble fiber, fiber, all of the germ. So the yummy, healthy heritage grain flour has a very short shelf life. I say very maybe six months, it has a short shelf life. You can't just stick it on the shelf at the grocery store and come back five years later and find it good. So they remove all of that stuff in order to um, have a shelf stable product. In the process, when the wheat germ gets wet, it decides it's going to sprout a new plant. And what it does is in order to create food for the new plant that's gonna grow, it sets off a chain of chemical reactions that break down the complex carbohydrates into simple sugars because that's what the plant needs to eat to grow. That's not necessarily what we want to eat. So when you're eating flour that comes out of these roller mills, you're basically getting a nutrient poor, fiber poor, taste less, aroma less, starchy, sugary powder. Um, what happens is um, this, this flour actually has a high glycemic index. Heritage wheat varieties have a low glycemic index. I mean, you literally have an insulin spike. I'm going to read you a quote by Michael Pollan, who is a food journalist. And what Michael Pollan said is, Michael Pollan wrote this, the invention of the cylinder mill and the refining of flour is the moment in history when the evolution of technology began to make our food worse instead of better. So making a lot of food is a good idea, but making a lot of food that makes people sick is not necessarily the best use of technology, in my own opinion. Um, the next and last stop, uh, step in this process is sifting. So how the flour is sifted to kind of determines the classification factor. Um, the sifter is, the, the interior of Johnny's Mill is like something out of Dr. Seuss. There are all these little tubes going everywhere. This is a square sifter and it's just like, it jiggles like this. And then it's just a mechanical process. There's lots of sieves in there. And then Johnny gets it, sits it in and takes a handful of flour. So I'm gonna show y'all flour and then we're gonna make pasta and lasagna. And I'm sorry if I go a little bit late. And if y'all have to jet out, I understand you're gonna get the recipes and I'll send pictures too. We may even have a video. So I'm going to show y'all now. Oh, I have to take my screen off the screen share. Lorenzo, can you hear me? And on Tisanto. Santo. Yeah, I can. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're off of screen sharing. I'm going to pin my screen so I can see what I'm doing. All right, so I'm going to show y'all flour. So the sifting process literally is the act of subtracting things. When you when you grind hard wheat, you get this sandy kind of flour. Can you just see how that's like little grains of sand? So this is hard wheat. It's been sifted, it's been ground up, stone ground, and they've removed the bran. This is the bran, this flaky stuff right here that actually, like I said, doesn't even grind up. This is how big this is when this gets to be that small. 
So the, the, the grist mill can get this into minute little particles, and this is what the bran looks like. We can't digest bran either. This is, let's see, here it is. The same, all right, so this is soft wheat flour. This is hard wheat flour. This is soft wheat flour. They're both number two, which means it's a whole grain. Only this, only this bran has been removed. What this contains that grocery store flour does not contain is fritello. So this is what's been sifted out to make grocery store flour. So here's just white grocery store flour. This is called number zero zero. Number zero is very similar. Heritage grain, stone ground, number two flour. If you remove the tritello, which is the noble flour, you get grocery store flour. So this is whole grain flour missing only a bit of bran. It contains all the noble fiber and the germ. Um, and like I said, it has kind of a short shelf life, but again, we're talking months, not days. So I'm gonna start making pasta with this flour. And if y'all would like to ask questions, I would love to answer them. I'm going to put the computer up here where you can see what I'm working on. I'm working from a single computer with a single camera. So I'm sorry I don't have perfect camera angles for you. Lorenzo, come here. Abbassa, abbassa un po'. But anche troppo, troppo. Ok, così, perfetto. So um, I made I made pasta with a blend of hard wheat and soft wheat flours, and I learned how to do that from an old Tuscan lady. And I asked Marco um, and Johnny how they make pasta, and when they make pasta at home, they do the same thing. We're not really sure why we do that, but that's just kind of what we all do. Um, I have a. Uh, basically just over a cup of hard wheat flour and just over a cup of soft wheat flour. I'm going to send you the recipe so you'll have the amounts and I'm going to make pasta out of this. this is so egg. why mix the two flours? Again, the hard wheat gives it some body. So that's why we, that's why we use that. Um, why I don't use all hard wheat, I can't answer that. I learned to do it this way from an old Tuscan grandma and I just, always done it that way. And again, like I said, I confirmed it with uh, the miller and the baker, and that's what they do too. So I'm not sure why we do that. If you buy a pasta, it's going to be one or the other. But if you add some um, hard wheat to the mix, it does give it some body. You can definitely do this with all soft wheat flour. So if you can't find semolina and you want to make pasta, there's no reason not to do that. But I kind of like to do the mix. Um, it gives the pasta some body and to me a little bit easier to work with. So I'm going to mix in three eggs. This is the recipe is called three eggs of flour. Three eggs of pasta, excuse me. I don't think I'm going to mess with the Tuscan recipe. I think I'm going <laughs> to stick with it. Personal preference, Paul, up to you. So I'm mixing the eggs. Aren't they beautiful? Can you see that, that awesome yellow color? Isn't that crazy? I love that. Made, huh? It looks great. I made a little well here. Kind of, it looks easier well. than it is. <laughs> <laughs> you can do this. Huh? We had a fail, Joe. Had, I had a fail, I had a fail at your house and I had a fail at my house. <laughs> You did good at my house. That's what I forced you. You weren't listening. <laughs> you weren't listening so. Well, so, so Elaine, what's if you were gonna buy have to buy a soft flour, an all-purpose flour over here? What would what, what's the best, or does it matter? I would go to a specialty shop like Gustiamo, Gustiamo.com, located in New York, and they actually sell some of this kind of flour. It's not from the same mill. It's from a, a mill down in Sicily, uh, owned by a guy called Filippo Drago. He's okay. great. I love him. He's my he's, he's he's my Johnny the Miller down in Sicily. He's Filippo the Miller. You can get his flour. Okay. It's called um, I think it's called Molino del Ponte. 
the mill of the bridge. It's from Castel Vitrano in Sicily. And he has, this man has, he works with the um, grain research station. They are bringing back all sorts of um, heritage grain varieties for that region. One cool thing about the heritage grain varieties is that it's a little bit like, um, like grape, like grape varieties or whatnot. They, they really, they change from area to area. So in this, every time I buy a bag of flour, there are probably 20 different varieties in the flour that I'm using right here. They all grow differently in different areas. So each area has their own distinctive set of uh, wheat varieties, which also of course provide flavor. So you're really getting a unique product. So you just work this until you can work it with your hands. And I'm not quite there yet, but as you can see, it's no longer gonna run onto the floor. <laughs> this is handy. There was, uh, there, I'm not sure it's this person, there was a person on Facebook who was really worried about cleanup. He didn't want to make pasta because he was worried about the cleanup. And I just don't even know what he's talking about. Because as long as you have one of these, you just scoop all that stuff right off of here and you're done. Although basically, if you do this properly, you shouldn't have much to clean up anyway. So the key here is to make a nice um, elastic dough that is not gooey. If it's gooey, it's not going to go through that machine right there. I get the flour and dough everywhere when I make it. I just accept I'm going to get it everywhere. It's going to fall on the floor. It's going to get on my shirt. Mary's going to laugh at me. This is one of the first thing. Sorry, Elaine. This is the one of the first thing that we learn to do in kitchen when we are uh, young kids and we okay. and we are uh, around uh, our granny. Who make pasta and this is the one the fountain with the flour is the one the first thing that we make that's great Lorenzo. It's it's to make and very satisfactory what i didn't hear that one it's easy to make and very satisfactory you are right, comfort food. Yes. So this is sticky, it's sticking to my hands. I'm gonna add some flour. Hard or soft flour? That happens to be soft. Oh, okay. And I'm about to, I, I moved my hard out of, out of the way without thinking that actually I need it. And I'm about to go back and get it. Um, the dough, this is a nice elastic dough. It's no longer sticky. I'm going to let it rest in some saran wrap, or you would let it rest. I actually, of course, have made a handy second ball. I have one ready to go. This needs to rest for sort of 15, 30 minutes before, um, before you roll it out. See how it springs back? It's a nice, smooth dough. It springs back. You might want to knead it a little bit longer, but I'm not going to keep you all here until tomorrow morning. So I'm going to just stop right there. And I'm going to wrap it up in saran wrap and let it sit for about 30 minutes. And at that point, you can really um, work with it. It's nice and um, manageable. So I miraculously have a ball of dough that's ready to go. I'm going to get my hard wheat flour. So one thing about these heritage grains is that they act a little bit differently. Um, when you make bread with it, for example, you cannot punch the dough down. There's no punching of the dough. Um, it rises once and that's it. There's no second rise. The gluten's not strong enough, really, to um, make one of those doughs where you, they literally say punch down in, in, um, in um, bread recipes. You can't do that with this. It also tends, it absorbs a lot of liquid. So this is going to be a little bit sticky. In any event, I prefer to have a sticky dough when I make pasta than a tough dough. There's nothing you can do to remedy a tough dough. If the dough is sticky, it will shred in the rollers. So you can always just dip it in flour and run it through the roller. So it's very easy to remedy um, a sticky dough. Let's see how this is. I'm rolling it through the machine. My goal here is to make these long sheets of pasta like this. The first couple go around. I'm going to add some more. Um, we're kind of like kneading it some more. I'm going to add a little bit of flour because it's slightly sticky. Um, and what we're making are, what we are making here are lasagna. So lasagna are actually, lasagna is the name of the shape of the pasta. 
And it was even included in uh, medieval recipe books here, talk about lasagna. And they were eaten by like eating spaghetti on a plate. They weren't necessarily baked. They started baking lasagna in the 1200s in Naples, in the Angevin court of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. They started baking um, lasagna in the oven with layers of pasta dough and layers of stuff in there. And they had things in there like cheese, pepper, cinnamon, and a little bit of sugar. That's the way they ate back then. They, of course, didn't have any tomatoes because Christopher Columbus had not yet been to America and tomatoes come from the New World, so there, was no, there were no tomatoes available. I am now closing up the rollers here on the pasta machine to make a nice long, very thin sheet of lasagna dough. And I'm gonna just keep moving the cylinders closer to each other so that my dough lengthens and thins out. So the first recipe for lasagna that contains tomato was in, was it, can anybody guess what year that was in, or even century? 1500. So Christopher Columbus went to, discovered, landed in the Americas in 1492. So it took him a while to get tomatoes and other coffee, not coffee, excuse me, chocolate over here from the um, world. So a little bit after that, but even still, they were kind of wary of tomatoes. They thought they were poisonous and they were used as ornamental plants. So the first recipe for lasagna that includes tomato is 1881. Isn't that amazing? Say the year again. 1881. Oh my God. Yeah, that's wow. amazing. I'm gonna let that just rest for a second and roll out, roll this out. I wonder who they tested the tomatoes on. <laughs> They were not opposed to abusing people. I'm sure they had lots of people to test the tomatoes on. Mm -hmm. well, I have a question. Uh -huh. It looks like your pasta machine is rested on a book where you have it clamped to the table there. Yeah, it is. Does that help keep it more secure? Because I have trouble with mine coming loose. Oh, Laura, my table top is only about that thin. And so it just needs a little bit more heft to it. So that's why I attached the book, because otherwise, it doesn't, it doesn't give it a good enough of a grip. So you might try that. Okay. Thank you. What, what's the final setting that you're using on the machine? All the way to the very end, but I haven't gone there yet because this is a little bit damp. I'm letting it just rest a minute before I run it through there. Um, you want lasagna to be super thin. The, the recipe for lasagna that, that calls for the tomatoes actually said, get a friend and start making dough because they think you need two people to do this. They were, of course, weren't using a machine. They were doing them rolling pin, but you really have to stretch and get the dough super, super thin. This dough is a little bit damp. If the dough is too damp, it's going to shred. So let's hope that doesn't happen, but if it does, we can just like, it can be a lesson. And it's not shredding, but even if it did, lasagna is just such an un- a seat dish. It is totally, isn't that beautiful? You can even see through it. You can, I can see my fingers through it. Um, lasagna is totally forgiving in that it does not have to be pretty when you're putting it together because the only thing you're going to see is the top. So as long as the top's pretty, you're good to go. All right, I'm going to, you would use probably another half of this, but I happen to have some that I made before, so I'm not going to do that. We might use this one. How long you can store the dough? You can keep the dough. If you let it dry really, really well, you can cut it in, if you can cut it into um, spaghetti shapes, pasta shapes, tagliatelle or whatever, you can, this machine has an attachment that allows you to just change where the handle is and roll out some tagliatelle, or you can just take your sheet of pasta and fold it up like this and then cut. And I'm not gonna do that because this is super wet and it's gonna stick. Can I, I have a question. Uh -huh. What is the your surface of the table? This is marble. Oh, okay, thank you. Here, I'm just making some little pretend tagliatelle and they're still sticking. But you can just literally fold over like you're making a, um, um, like a paper snowflake <laughs> and you can make pasta. 
You can make tagliatelle. This stuff's a little too sticky for that. You would, if you were gonna make tagliatelle, which we're not doing, um, you would let it rest a little bit. But since we're making lasagna, we don't have to let it rest. So let me get my lasagna ingredients. We're just gonna assemble the lasagna and then get it in the oven. And we're making an asparagus lasagna. So we're, we've got, I've got asparagus, and I'm, what I've used a lot of is green garlic. I don't know if y'all can find this or not. This is in season when asparagus is in season. So the asparagus has been um, prepared as, these are the little spears. I've just kind of reserved the spears. And I've turned the rest of the, um, the tips anyway, this, this, and I've turned the rest of the asparagus stalk into a, um, cream. So lasagna that is made in this region, Tuscany and also Emilia Romagna, uses bechamel in the layers. In Naples they use cheese up here, we use bechamel. So I'm going to layer pasta, asparagus cream, and bechamel. And I made kind of a loose bechamel, so we're not going to cook the pasta sheet. They're going to actually cook in the oven. So you want kind of a loose bechamel that um, all, the, all this liquid will then help cook the pasta sheets. And then this is the garlic that's been sauteed. Um, and I, I'm going to mix it in here just so you can see it. So this is actually garlic before the bulbs turn into the what you think of as garlic. Um, and like I said, this is in season when asparagus is in season. It's just such a yummy, very subtle, fresh flavor. And you use, kind of as if it were a leek, you use from the bulb end all the way up to about here. So you just cut it up into sort of any pieces that you want. I just made sort of, you know, medium kind of julienne about that long. Saute that. I'm going to add that to the asparagus cream. So this is going to be in the layers with the pasta and the bechamel. And then the other flavorings that I'm going to add are just a super subtle because I don't want to cover up the aroma and flavor of the asparagus, which is so delicate. So to be careful with that, um, I'm using a little bit of lemon zest and some white pepper, and that's it. Some Parmesan cheese. Parmesan's a staple in here. You can't you can't have a lasagna. Like, what? What? The like, what was the components of the uh, asparagus cream? I know asparagus. I, got I say that. cream. I say cream. Basically, it's asparagus puree. Um, okay. And I, uh, I'm, and like I said, I'll send you the recipe. I cooked it in a little bit of broth with some salt, pepper. Excuse me, just salt and olive oil. And then I overcooked it a little bit and warmed it up in the um, Cuisinart Robo Poop. And I saved a little bit of cooking liquid, liquid in case I needed to make it creamy, but it wasn't necessary this time because asparagus sometimes can hold a lot of liquid. In fact, they, they made a little liquid even. I don't know if y'all noticed that. Um, so I didn't even have to add the liquid. So it's not really a cream, it's just a puree. So I'm going to just take the first layer of the lasagna is just a little bit of vegetable in the bottom of the pan so that it doesn't stick. Um, and then I'm going to layer a layer of pasta, again, does not have to be pretty. No one's going to see this. So as long, and I'm just even, here's another way to do this. Kitchen scissors works like a charm. So just cover the bottom. And I'm gonna put on another layer of bechamel. I use white pepper in the bechamel as well. White pepper is so fragrant. And usually bought most of the Italian recipes for bechamel want you to use some nutmeg. I just think that would clash horribly with the asparagus. So I just went for white pepper and it's just so amazingly aromatic. And I'm, you'll see where I put it. There's a little bit in the um, bechamel and I'm gonna be really careful with my flavorings because I don't wanna cover up, like I said, the asparagus flavor. So we're gonna put in some white pepper on one layer only. And then we're gonna put in some lemon zest on one layer only. And then in the oven, the lemon zest permeates the whole, the whole thing. It's just amazing. So spread around a little of the little asparagus. If you were doing a real traditional uh, Tuscan lasagna, this you would be using a, a kind of tomato meat sauce instead of the asparagus. 
that's that's kind of what, the, what most people's grandmothers make. Giusto Lorenzo. Giusto. It's correct. And then Parmesan. So the the base here is um, the fundamental part of the recipe is layers of bechamel flavoring. In this case, it's asparagus, and then um, Parmesan cheese. And, and you know the curiosity of bechamel. The, the origin of bechamel, we, if you uh, ask uh, an Italian man, if you ask to an Italian, you say that uh, all, all Italians say that all the recipe born in Italy, but the origin, uh, France origin, uh, they say that's from the Marquise of uh, bechamel, but uh, oh. when um, Caterina de' Medici go to France. I, I knew he was going to say that because everybody from Florence, go ahead. Go. Bye, bye, Monty. They, when Caterina de' Medici go in France, uh, they bring some cook, cooking man that use Chef. a, chefs, then they use a sauce that they call uh, glue sauce because they used to stick the thing between us. So they, we say that bechamel was born in, Flo in Italy, in Tuscany, but in the France, people want to bring in your uh, own recipe. But basically what he's doing is he's being extremely patriotic Florentine. Yeah. Which one of the, um, Catherine de' Medici married one of the Louis the King, Louis the X, X something or other of France and took her chefs with her. So Italians claim French cuisine. All. What? Claim all. Italian claim all. Claim all, all cuisines. Yeah. All right, so, I'm, all right, so the layer, the previous layer I did had uh, white pepper as the extra, and this layer is going to have some lemon zest as the extra. What is the carrot on? Hey, Elaine. Uh huh. If you can't find spring garlic, can you use leeks? Thank you for asking me that. Um, I don't really think leeks are going to go very well with the um, asparagus. So what I would do in that case is just leave that out. And what you can to get a little hint of garlic flavor without overdoing it, you can take um, a clove of garlic, cut in half, and just rub the inside of the dish. And that will permeate again, just permeate a little bit um, with a little kind of delicate garlic flavor without overdoing it. So that's what I would do if I didn't have the fresh garlic. 35. Okay, go. Elaine, um, uh -huh. if, if you um, plant garlic cloves, can you get that? Yes. Okay. Is there uh, a better time of year to do that? These are giant. The one, I've, I've done it before. Mine are sort of slender like my little finger. So, yeah, they're very good. Okay, so, so in other words, if you plant a, a clove of garlic and you get those green shoots, they'll work? Yep, that's exactly, that's exactly oh. what that is. This is like elephant oh, okay. garlic though, it's enormous. So okay. I'm sorry I'm running over, um, but we're almost done. So I'm doing one layer with some lemon zest. And like I said, in the oven, the lemon flavor is gonna permeate the entire thing. I'm gonna do one more layer and then we'll put it in the oven. And, um, See that door, that wooden door right there? Before we sign off, I'm gonna take y'all on a little tour of the hidden part of the Popiano house here. Is there wine behind that door? <laughs> There's gotta be wine somewhere. Again, good thing this doesn't have to be pretty because I'm kind of making a mess of this layer, but no one will ever know. No one will know. It looks what good. Wine, oh, sorry. Go what ahead. wine would you suggest with this? I would say a white wine, first of all, and I was thinking of something sort of from Northern Italy. There was a great article, Eric Asimov writes the um, wine articles for the New York Times, wine journalist for the New York Times in the food section. And last week, he did an article on Italian whites, affordable Italian whites. And they're all, what he loves about them is that they're all these funky um, varieties that you might not 
you may not have ever heard of. I would pick something like a Garbaniga from the Veneto Chagatas or a Noziola from, um, from Trentino Alto Adige. Um, you might even, even something fizzy. And um, the south of Italy makes great fizzy wines. And in fact, because the bechamel is so fatty, um, I made it with olive oil, by the way, olive oil bechamel. But um, you could even drink some really acidic, sparkling wine with this, it'd be great. When you said an olive oil bechamel, olive oil instead of what? Butter. So usually to make a bechamel, you combine equal parts of flour and butter and kind of make like, like you're about to make a roux, kind of cook the flour a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then you add um, milk. And you can add, you can add also actually add garlic to that, but it always, just, to me, it just turns kind of metallic. It's, it's not good. Add the garlic elsewhere. Um, so you cook um, the flour and butter, and then you add milk to it, basically, and just stir, and the cooked flour just makes it thicken. And again, this is a loose bechamel, and I did it this way on purpose, because this is 45 minutes in the oven, so I didn't want to have a thick bechamel. It needs to be kind of loose. I'm using half of my asparagus spears here in this layer to, excuse me, and then I'm going to go ahead and finish this out so that y'all can get on about your weekend. So this is going to be our last layer. The last layer gets pasta, bechamel, and cheese, and that's it. And I'm going to add some asparagus tips because just kind of for show. So at the bechamel, do you think it would be possible to do an alternative to dairy milk? Because if you did olive oil flour an alternative, then it's a dairy-free product? True. I tried that before and it wasn't very successful. Um, I, I think I used almond milk and it just was not successful. I mean, maybe I used soy milk, but it was not successful, um, okay. unfortunately. Okay, some things uh, don't work to uh, substitute. Right, it just did not thicken up and it, it had a weird flavor and it was runny. And I remember I even tried to add um, um, like starch to it or something to thicken it up. It was a, it was a disaster. Okay. Thank you. You saved me the trouble. Yeah, don't don't even bother. <laughs> I saved you two liters of almond milk. So this is the last layer. Sorry about my technical difficulties, you guys. I'm horrified. I'm plotting in my head what I'm going to say to the internet company tomorrow when I call them. Or Monday, I guess it'll be. It's all good. It's part of the quaint thing of being in the Tuscan countryside. Isn't it? Yeah, I'm hoping it's quaint. <laughs> okay, so this is just kind of pretty. And then I'm going to put some cheese on top and it gets pretty golden color. Last a little bit. All right, I'm going to go run, put this in the oven, come back here, get y'all, and we're going to go on a little visit. Um, quick visit, I promise. And then we'll see a finished project, pro product. One second. I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting hungry. We got to figure out how to be eating this while we're watching. I agree. I'm hungry too. <laughs> what did you learn to make last time? Uh, cassata and uh, cannolis. Cannoli, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm back. Okay, oh, I'm going to take y'all on a little surprise tour of what is my wine cellar. But it's also, so y'all saw in the photographs my house, right? Um, can y'all, is this good? The camera shot, Lorenzo Sivere Bene. So behind this door, we go down to what my mother calls the dungeon. So we're going downstairs. It's carved out of the rock down there. Elaine? Yeah? I think the door is original to the house. Yes, the door is original to the house. This is how the door opens and closes. Is, is that a view? Can you see that? Abbasampo. Perfect. Allora, so we're going to go down into the wine cellar, and not only is it cool because it's full of wine, which is a good thing, this, hang on, here we go, I, can't, I don't want to lose signal again. So here's the stash. Can y'all see that okay? But then really? see this passageway right here? 
that actually is go, it's a tunnel that leads to the castle. It's an escape route. Isn't that cool? Elaine, does it go all the way? Does, is it still functional? It is not still functional. My landlords would not be having any of that, believe me. Um, no, it's been, it's been, it's been uh, walled up. But this was a very, a very common occurrence in these properties. These kinds of properties, there's an escape route out of the um, castle in times, for times of need. So, and then I don't know where those works of art were, but my mom and I kind of like to think that they were down here. So maybe the Pontorma was like in my wine cellar. That's so right. I, right. I'm going to grab a bottle of wine. I'm actually going to drink this. Yeah. I'll show you that in a second. The tunnel could also be used for uh, restashing the wine, right? You have the castle, the old wine. Sure. Are y'all getting a view of backstage? It's not very pretty. I don't can y'all see me okay? Sí, so, miraculously, look, here is our lovely cup lasagna. Yum. Beautiful. See how pretty and golden it gets on top? Well, let's see the inside. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll cut you a piece. Would you like one? <laughs> I'll have one. There's plenty to go around. Let's see what it looks like. Maybe this is how Jesus fed the 5,000. It might be. That is like, a, that feeding the like loaves and the fishes thing, that is a total Italian woman thing. If I have eight people come into dinner, eight people eat. An Italian woman can feed 20 people out of a pot that's about that big. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> it is true. I had uh, coffee with some people earlier today. Here is Shannon's. And I made a three cupper, a three, I made this. This is a three cup, because this makes three cups of coffee. Mm -hmm. And there were six of us. And so I said, we were spaced out in the garden, by the way. Um, so I made somebody else pour, because if I pour out of a three cupper, I get three cups, but there were six of us. So an Italian person had to pour, because then six people can have coffee. Like total loves in the fishes. I was just thinking if it's on is that Zoom. Italian math? Yeah, maybe it is. Can y'all hear? Look, look at our pretty layers. Can you see them? Oh, I credit oh, wow. that guy got all. Here, make this way. Look, this looks to look prettier. Celia Chirazoli, what do you think? We have a professional lasagna maker on tonight. I want to know what her opinion is of this. She might have dark. I think I think that's absolutely beautiful, and I love the idea that you did the asparagus and that young garlic, the lemon zest. That's so. I, I can't wait to try it. I'm really excited. It looks great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is fantastic. Lasagna. She's a lasagna maker pro. So. Yeah, well, well, I, I did sell the business. I don't, I, yeah, I did. But um, actually, my granddaughter, who's also a Celia, and I still um, help out. So we, they, we spent this whole weekend making lasagna. Oh, but uh, it was a little bit more, more yeah. yeah, it's, a, ours is a little bit more, um, I want to say mass produced. We do it all by hand, but we do use a Cuisinart to make the pasta. Because okay. if we had to do it, and make, we, we would never get it. We couldn't charge enough. And so it, we do use a Cuisinart to make the pasta. Don't you do 12 layers? Oh, no. It's more like 20 or 30. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you have yeah, to have But it, the, the pasta, as you said, the pasta is very, very thin. Right. And, and we also don't, we put very little in each layer. So we do a spinach pasta and a, a regular egg pasta. So the egg pasta gets the um, tomato sauce, which has a little bit of ground beef in it, and um, mozzarella. And then the um, spinach layer gets the bechamel and the parmigiano. Oh, but very, very little. Yeah, very, very little on each layer. Right. So that it's really about, more about the pasta than it is the sauce so yeah. it's actually about uh, it's about three inches high That's so you know it's it's different but i am so excited about trying this with the asparagus and the lemon zest well, so, what do you think i want all of y'all to try this anybody who tries it post it on social media and tag me okay, okay. yeah we'll do that 
for next go round, we're going to do an olive oil tasting, and I promise I won't go over. I'm sorry. I've, I've had oh, it's okay. Every morning. Um, but I'll send y'all the recipes tomorrow and information about an olive oil tasting session, which is two weeks out. Um, so we'll hopefully I'll see you back here in two weeks. All right. Thank you. It's great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can we have you? Yeah. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see everybody because I have the tiny little. Um, <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Elaine. This was wonderful. Oh. Good to see you. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks for sitting here. I love our big group today. Elaine, I sent you some pictures of our pasta. You'll have a get a kick out of it. Okay, good. <laughs> Enjoy what's it. That hanging, what's that what's hanging that? behind you? What? It's a bowl. Somebody else said anything. It's brandy glass. It's a sieve. Oh. It's a brandy glass. <laughs> Elaine, what was that wine you pulled out? Oh, thanks for asking, Mary. This is a Trebbiano. It's called uh -huh. Cream Passi by Daniel Perotti at Sagona on Prato Magno. And um, I actually am collaborating with Daniele on his olive oil production. I'll tell you all more about that next week. And this is a Trebbiano Malvasia Bianca blend. And he calls it Primi Passi, which means first steps. He's, um, he, his first vintage was in 2012 and he is a wonderful, humble person. And so he called his first wine, first steps. But it's so good I told him that he could change the name of it and call it one giant leap. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind because it's always excellent. Beautiful, fresh, delicate, Wonderful, it's gonna, and it's got some really good acidity and it's gonna go great with the asparagus and the bechamel. So, bon appetit, I do see. So, Elaine, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Um, I wanted to show you what I bought. So, from Papiano, Steven Santo. Oh, I think that's a screen. Hang on, let me, let me unpin myself and then I'll be able to see. Oh, okay. You found Vincento? No. Yeah, from Papiano. Yay. Yeah, I got it through Washington, D.C. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, hey. Let's talk to Susan. Hey, good. Good to know. Yeah. Great. Well, All right. Well, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Thanks a lot, you guys. Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. Want, Go I ahead ask you is the woodworker that was around the corner from your apartment is he still there yes and he did this for me because when i decided to do this in total lockdown we're sort of in semi lockdown right now but when we were in total lockdown i told him what i wanted to do and i said can you please help me figure out a computer stand can y'all see that i have a yeah yeah <laughs> well when we were there we we bought um two cutting boards from him and they are here in my kitchen. They're pretty. Very pretty, nice. I love them. They make me think of our trip every day. That's great, I like to know that. That's excellent. And I'll tell him too, he'll be very pleased. Yes, yeah, tell him we said hello. I will do so, I will. Elaine, Elaine this is Scratch. I'm Mary Parrott's sister. Oh, hi. Um, but have you heard of um, Spinocchia? In, it's um, near Siena. Um, I stayed there for a couple weeks for a school trip in 09. I mean, I was in the, I wasn't in school, but I took a trip with a class and it was just the most glorious and your pictures brought me back to all of it. And I'm like, I want to go, oh, um, but you have heard of it. I've heard of it because a colleague of mine teaches painting workshops down there. Okay. So yeah. It's a 12th century villa. They turn into an organic farm and then people right. stay there, but also students that are learning hospitality stay and they um, talk about the meals every night and explain what is in them and how they were prepared. And then the, um, it's all about the slow food movement and the gardener tells the chef what's ready to be harvested. Wow. And then they make the menu based on that. It's just the most dreamy they have, experience. They have a cheesemaker on the property as well, don't they? Um, probably. I think they have a cheese maker on the property. Yeah, it sounds like a whole kind of self-sustaining little community. It's nice. Yeah, Mary, Paul, and I, we should go hang out there. Come on over. You'll have okay. to come here first, though. We will. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Thank you so all much. All y'all come visit. Perry Blanton, you too. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye, y'all. I'm signing off. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Questions, send me an email. Okay. I'm sorry I have kind of like glazed over some of that um, dense uh, wheat info. Mm -hmm. We can talk about email too. And I hope I'll see y'all two weeks from now. Yeah. All right. Bye, Elaine. Bye, Thank Bye. you. Thank you. So Bye, Mom. Bye bye. That's her mom. Yeah. <laughs> bye, Elaine. Bye, that's my dad. Bye, Everybody, hey, bye. I can't, I can't turn it off because like, I know everybody on here. Hey, Susan and Vince. I can't turn it off while y'all are sitting here looking at me. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right, I'll see y'all next time. Yes. Right. Bye. Bye.